this class on Methodism, uh, which this is class six, by the way, uh, but this class on, on Methodism uh, and the way we had been doing things in, in the back. So if you'll remember, there was a lot more class discussion and participation in, in the back, and we let it kind of take on a life of its own. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to do a combination tonight, and I'm going to see how that works. Uh, I, it's got to work better than what I did last time. Um, hang on just one second, if you don't mind. I want to turn this on. Never. Okay. There. Right there. Okay, we'll get to you in a few minutes. I'm, I know me well enough to know that that needs to be down there. <laughs> when I do that in just a few minutes, Brian is going to go, oh, oh. <laughs> I know that will be forthcoming. I've already been baptized. Don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Never with caffeine, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so far, well, maybe you were. I don't know. It's possible. Who knows? Okay, uh, so um, I'm... You, all of you guys have been here, so you know all the different books that we're using, so I'm not going to run through all of those books again. I'm also not going to go back and re-talk about um, the highlights of our last class, because I think that's been amply covered. Uh, you know, communion and why we do communion, why people were ordained and the difference. I do want to take a second before we go to the first slide here and talk about um, I want to talk about the itinerancy for just a second, uh, and, and it leads into what we're going to talk about today. Uh, when you go back and read the journals of the itinerant preachers, now you all remember what the itinerant preachers were. They were the preachers that uh, were on horseback, right? You know, that, that had a... Uh, a long charge, you know, however long it was, and they would go from place to place to place to place. And long, long before, uh, I just want to lay this out a little bit, long before, long before they ever had church buildings, so to speak. I mean, there were some church buildings, you know, they would, and there, was, there were different ways that they did that. A lot of times they would build... Uh, a building with the Baptist and the Congregationalists, they would all build one building together and call it a unity building, and they would take turns using it. Like, you know, the, the Congregationalists would use it for a while, and the Baptists would use it for a while. So they would build one building, and then all of them would take turns with that. But usually in, in, the, in that situation, the only thing that was unified was somebody's desire to be there when everybody else was, you know, and they, they at one point uh, in one of those buildings to to keep the Methodist out uh, from coming in and using it, a guy took the door off and sat on it so nobody could. He was a rather large man and he sat on it so nobody could pass him and get into the door uh, because he didn't like the way the Methodists did their worship. Uh, and so he, he was going to make sure that they didn't get in to do their worship. So it didn't, it, that didn't work. But typically, typically, they were in houses. I mean, we, we've talked about this all along the way. They were in houses over and over and over again. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about... And there, there were all kinds of examples in every book that I read from pastors who had been called and, and the stories of their calling were absolutely amazing. And, and it's stuff where, where they, they have um, supernatural dreams, supernatural visions, uh, where God would come to them and, and uh, minister to them 
and call them into, into the ministry, first call them into Christianity, and then call them into uh, ministry itself through supernatural uh, uh, means. And when we talk about supernatural, um, a lot of people get very uncomfortable. You know, one, one of the things about, you, you've heard me say this over and over and over again, <clears throat> a lot of people have the understanding of the Holy Spirit that it's the crazy uncle in the attic, right? And if you invoke the power of the Holy Spirit to come and be part of your worship service, what you're actually doing is asking for the crazy third of the Godhead to come to worship and you're just not sure what you're going to get when he shows up. So it would just be better off for everybody if he didn't. And you left the good order of the church orderly, right? Because you don't want the Holy Spirit showing up and messing things up, right? Because there's a way things are supposed to be, supposed to be done. So, um, one of the things that, that I think is imperative is for us to, and I know I'm repeating myself on, on some of this, but for us to recognize that in America, even in the 21st century, right, right now, we are slaves to enlightenment thinking, right? And now, now I want to explain to you what I mean by enlightenment thinking. Enlightenment thinking is thinking, it's very scientific, and I'm not anti-science at all. But enlightenment thinking says that if you can't sense it with one of your basic five senses, and if you can't replicate it in a scientific experiment, it does not exist. If you can't touch it, if you can't taste it, if you can't smell it, if you can't hear it, and if you can't see it, and if you can't replicate it in a scientific experiment, it does not exist. And the problem we have with that is God. I mean, that, that, that generates a huge problem for the church, right? This is a conundrum because you've got God who you can't see, touch, taste, smell, or hear. You can't replicate God in a scientific experiment. Yet, somehow, we've got to find a space for him in that reality. Or, with many in the scientific community, we have to say, God does not exist. So that's a problem. So either God doesn't exist or there's a gap, there's a problem with that theory. Right? I mean, it's got to be one or the other. There's either a problem with, with enlightenment thinking or God simply does not exist. And the problem gets even bigger because if God does exist and he's outside of that paradigm, right? If God does exist and he's outside of the paradigm of what you can see, taste, touch, smell, hear, then what else exists outside of that paradigm, right? That, that creates a, a big problem for people. So we have to discount the whole book of Acts. We have to discount the Bible because the Bible is supernatural work from beginning to end. I mean, there's just, you cannot read the Bible and, <clears throat> and through a prism other than, than the supernatural. First off, first off, First off, read the Bible and explain the virgin birth without supernatural wonder. 
right? Without signs and wonder. Well, there's all kinds of people that look and say, well, the best way to explain that is to say it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Now, all of a sudden, you can explain the, the virgin birth because there was none. Right? And that's the way a lot of people handle anything that they can't fit into that paradigm. But, but, but they're still left with the problem of God. Because God doesn't fit in that paradigm. And, and what do we do about that? Um, so tonight we're going to talk about... Uh, Steve, it's your turn to be kicked under the bus. It's the gift that keeps on giving, my friend. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, So, one of the questions that you asked early, which was just a phenomenal question, is what precipitated the growth? This, this amazing explosion, right, of, of Methodism. And we talked about several things. We talked about itinerancy, right? You know, we, we talked about how uh, Wesley uh, had an understanding of faith that was, everyone was eligible. It wasn't just the elect, right? But everyone who repents is eligible to to enter the kingdom of God and to have eternal relationship with God. But there was another thing other than that, and that, that still plays a big part in it, but there's another thing, and, um, and it was the fact that in the early, early part of Methodism, it was a red hot Religion, I mean, it was, it was fiery, you know. It, it was a, a spirit-filled, fiery, red-hot experience. And when Methodism showed up on the scene, it came with signs and wonders. You know, it came, it came, bringing all of the charisma with it. You know, it it came with 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 thunder. Uh, so Scott, go to the go to the first slide that's not about a book. Uh, I don't want to either. I get it. Next one. Next one. Next one. I just love it right there. So this that I'm going to read you is about an African American that was a had been a slave. Okay? And this is a quote from him. He said, "I went to church, I went on to church, and the brothers and sisters prayed around me. Then like a flash, the power of God struck me. It seemed like something struck me in the top of my head and then went on through the toes of my feet. I jumped, rather fell back against the back of the seat. I lay on the floor of the church. A voice had said to me, you are no longer a sinner. <laughs> Go and to gland, gland and gland, gland and tell the world. Go and tell the world what I have done for you. Obviously, I haven't uh, edited these very well. Uh, but go and tell the world what I've done for you. So I, I just, this, and this guy, you know, of course, gave his life to God uh, from, from that experience. And uh, I, the, the, book, uh, the book is just, or the books that I've read are full of uh, these kinds of experiences of people who came into relationship with God through, through these special signs and, and wonders. Um, there's a uh, book, and I haven't put this book up here. I'll show it to you next week. I'll bring it with me next week. Uh, it's called The Supernatural Occurrences of John Wesley. So John Wesley himself, in his journals, his journals are filled with signs and wonders, with, with things that God had done 
uh, miraculous, miraculous things that, that God had done. Uh, go to the next one, Scott. Thomas Walcott, this is on October of 1789. He took a journey and he was going to check out. He came from England and he came over and, and he was going to go through uh, regions and report on what he found. And in a letter that he wrote to this dude named James Freeman, he said, Methodist meetings were attended with all that confusion, violence, and distortion of the body, body, voices and gestures that characterized such a boiling hot religion. In much the same manner, he goes on to say, Horton's, Samson Maynard's, and Billy Hibbard's autobiographies are filled with stories of dreams, impressions, shouting, divine healing. Also, one account of a woman being raised from the dead. Methodism's attraction went far beyond the intellectual appeal of Arminianism to include new concepts of how to mediate one's daily relationship with God. It may not be an exaggeration to say that this quest for the supernatural in everyday life was the most distinctive characteristic of early American Methodism. So I want to pause here. And I want to give you just a second to respond to all that. Uh, so one of, the, one, of the, one of the big things of early Methodism, it was a spirit-filled event. There was stuff going on. People were slain in the spirit. You have stories of, of uh, prophets, prophecies, wisdom, uh, utterances, uh, speaking in tongues, being slain in the spirit. Uh, some people call it resting in the spirit. Others call it being slain in the spirit. Uh, all of these were, were uh, all along the route of Methodism. It's littered with stories of acts type worship in the early church of Methodism. Now, uh, we'll get to in a few minutes why it didn't happen so much in England as it did in America and why once it got to America, it took off and exploded in, in the way that it did. But what are, your, what are your thoughts about these kinds of expressions of, of, of worship and what its place is in, in today's church? Yeah. Yeah. But then as you're speaking, then I realized a lot of our services are the flip side of that, where everything's orderly and passive and there's good worship like that. Would we welcome it if it showed up? Scott?
Well, I would like to say first and foremost that my understanding and my reading of the scripture is there's nothing in it that indicates for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit that you have to speak in tongues. Right. Uh, you know, and I do know that there are churches who do believe in, and teach that. But it's, uh, it's certainly not my understanding that this is a mandate of scripture. I don't see anywhere. As a matter of fact, Paul says... If you're going to speak in tongues, it's much better that you do it in your private worship than to do it in public because, you know, one word of prophecy is worth a thousand, and I'm paraphrasing, right? But, you know, one, one word of prophecy is worth a thousand uh, that are, are spoken, you know, in tongues or something, something, something like that. And uh, that's kind of the, the gist of what he's saying. Uh, that's not to discount. Uh, the gift of, of speaking in tongues at all. I don't want to put those churches down in any way. Uh, it's just that I was very young in my faith at that time. Uh, and walking into a church like that and not expecting anything like that, it was quite different from anything that I'd ever seen. It's kind of mind blowing, and, and right? I did not feel well. Yeah. Uh, so I would say, and you know, they, Francis Asbury had a lot of these experiences in his life, you know, in places that he preached and places that he taught. And uh, a lot of people wanted Asbury to try to squelch this kind of activity in, in the church, you know, to, to try to shut these lunatics up and... Uh, and so Asbury's take on it was uh, in pulling up weeds, a lot of times you tend to pull up very good weeds or very good plants with the weeds. You know, I mean, and so he would rather uh, leave the, some of the weeds in place than to uproot some really good stuff that God was doing in people's lives. And so instead of squelching uh, what he, and he, he said, I, I, how, do you, how do you tell the difference? You know, for him, how do you know what's the weed and what's, what's the good plant? And I don't want to uproot. Uh, and a lot of the worship, and there was, there was revival. There were people being saved. And yes, there were are doubtless, doubtless, there are people that are, are uh, faking it, uh, for lack of a better word, but also there were people who were not, you know, and, and so how do you make that distinctive, you know, characteristic? Uh, I, think, I think sometime we're so in love with the good order of the church that we don't want anything to interfere with that. You know, we don't want, we don't want, I, th I, <laughs> I, I think I've told you this story before. When I was, uh, when I was uh, no older than 14, no older than 14, I was invited to, I, I, part, the problem with me was I'd preach anywhere they asked me. I didn't care what denomination. If they gave me a chance to preach, I was going to preach. So I was 14. They invited me. My mama said she'd take me. So mama drug me up this creek. I call it creek. Some people call it creek. You know, is what, whatever floats your boat, it's creek. But uh, so, uh, so they invited me to go to this place. And, and the... Uh, there was a, the, the room would have been about the size of this, right? But the back behind the pulpit area was deeper than that by, it probably would have went another 15 or 20 feet back there. And, and there was a chair way back there in the back and then there was the pulpit chairs up here. And when, I, when it came time for me to preach that night, there was this old dude, and I mean, I mean, Methuselah old. If he wasn't like 969 years old, he wasn't a day. And he was sitting all the way back there in the back. And, and he was kind of leaned over like this in the chair. And so my thought is, okay, he's dead. <laughs> you know, that he's, he's, he, he's dead. And so 
I'm, the pulpit is kind of like this, like one over here and one over here, and I'm preaching from this pulpit. And, and there was a bit, all this was open, this whole area up here was open, and so I was a little more rambunctious when I preached back then. And, and I was finally starting to get my rhythm. You know, you start out a little slow and a little slow. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to get my rhythm. And I'm walking back and forth. And I'm walking back and forth. And I'm preaching. And the fire's boiling up in me. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm... And this dude, that one, all of a sudden, from way back there, stood up and screamed... Like a banshee. I mean, it was worship to him, but that, that, I don't know what kind of church it was, but it was some kind of Pentecostal because he stood up and bellowed. And when he did, I'm standing about right here, and I leapt over the altar rail and I'm backing down the aisle like this with my hands up in the air because I'm terrified, right? And, and I'm like, oh! Ah! And they thought I was in the spirit. And I mean, it broke open, man. I mean, there are people that are now standing up and shouting and praising God. And it wasn't me being in the spirit of anything other than holy terror. Because that man scared me to death. So yeah, that night, mine was fake. Um, you, know, you know, because there was nothing authentic other than the fear that I felt, you know, when... When I leapt across that, uh, that altar rail. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, I, I have been in services. Well, even, even here. Uh, even here. Um, when uh, somebody help me with her name. Nellie yep. Yeah, yeah. Nellie. You know, when Nellie came up to, to be anointed, we were having an anointing service here, and, and Nellie came up to be anointed, and if you'll remember, Ricky carried her out of the church, and I, I laid hands on her, and when I laid hands on her to pray for her and anoint her, boom, she dropped like a ton of bricks. And, and when I went to her home later, you know, at first, I have, to, I have to be honest with you, the first thing I thought was, She'd stood in line. She was tired. She was exhausted. She couldn't handle it anymore. She collapsed because she was sick. You know, and Ricky got up and picked her up. And I went and talked to her in her home. Ricky took her home. And then the next day I went over to visit her. And when I was talking to her, she said, Pastor Jean, she, she said, I have been going to church my whole life. She said, and I've never had anything like that happen to me. It's like God hit me with a truck said it just started burning in my head and it was like a ton of bricks fell on me and I couldn't stand. And she said, boom, I hit the floor. And she said, and while I was there, I knew God was working on my life. I knew God was doing something to me. And I, I said, well, well hall hallelujah, you know, hallelujah. And she's gone now. You know, she's, she's, we did her funeral here at the church and but, but, and the, 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 there's a whole story that, that goes behind the, the whole Nelly experience, you know, that I can tell you on, on another day. But, uh, but there are times when God does unexplainable things, you know, just un, unexplainable things. And sometimes God will just knock your socks off. And, and, uh, So I know that, that, that depending on what tradition you grow up in, your experience is going to be different, right? Um, but what do you do when God shows up like that? You know, what, what do you do? What do you do when God heals you? You know, how do you handle that when you're healed by God? You know, and you can say, I don't believe in healing until you're healed. <laughs> you know, uh, Dreama wouldn't mind me saying this, but Dreama's been healed of cancer twice in her life now, two different times. 
completely different types of cancer in her life that she's been healed of. Casey, uh, who sits back in the back with the four little antichrist children. Uh, they actually sit in the front. Two of them were baptized last Sunday or Easter, Easter Sunday. Yeah. Uh, the doctor, uh, just, just as a reminder, uh, they had set up uh, treatments for her to be uh, at the James because she had breast cancer. And so they set her treatments up and she was supposed to start the next week. And to get ready for that, they called her and said, will you come in? We need to do a chest x-ray. And after they did the chest x-ray, she went home on a Friday. And they called her and said, you need to come back in. Something's wrong with your test. And, and they left her with that over the weekend uh, till Monday. Well, when she talked to them on Monday, they told her that they were canceling all of her treatments because her rib cage was so lit up with cancer that there was zero point in doing the treatments for her for breast surgery or for her uh, breast cancer. Of course, she panicked. <laughs> I would have panicked too. You know, because she has four kids, you know, and she's, uh, and so she called me and she said, will you pray for me? Will you anoint me and pray for me? And so we anointed her and we prayed for her. And she went back in and asked them to redo the test after I anointed her because she felt like she'd been healed. And I felt like she'd been healed too. And that's another story for another day, how that happened. And when she went back in, they, they tested her and her rib cage was 100% clean. There was no cancer in her rib cage. And there was still one spot, one small spot on one breast that was left of the cancer and she took treatments for all that. And, uh, and now she's considered cancer free. And, and I know she was healed. You know, I, I know she was healed. Uh, we, can, we can go down the list and we can talk about other, other healings that God has done in this congregation. You know, in, in this congregation, in the last four years, and even before that, but I, the ones I know of are, are in the last, last four years. Uh, but what do you do with the supernatural? You know, what, what, what do you do? Why does the Bible deal with it? Why does the Bible talk about it? Why is it in there? First, we have to acknowledge that the Bible is a book of the supernatural because God's in it. Right, and it's God's self-revelation to us. So, what what do we do? What do we do with with that? And what's our role in it? What's our role? Not not just the role of the pastor, but what's your role in the supernatural? Any thoughts on that? Excuse me? It's in there to help people believe. It is in there to help people to believe. I, amen. Mm-hmm. Along that same line, we've talked about it before, about, you know, the word faith. You know, how do you, how do you promote faith in the supernatural? Or something that doesn't, you know, fit into that paradigm of the, the five things. I think we have to adopt the attitude of Asbury and say we don't know, right? Uh, and it's like being, like when I went to that church, it seemed like there were people who were faking it and some who weren't. But I don't know. There's no way for me to know. Um, so we have to be less judgmental. 
kind of along the same lines, and I'll eventually get to it. You, talk, you talked about the growth of, of the Methodist uh, following back in the 1700s, and it seems to me, I'm going to make the assumption that church was probably pretty darn boring. And then you had this new surge of, you know, the presentation, and, the, and, and the, maybe the story was a little bit different, but the presentation was certainly different. Maybe there was, you know, more exciting, louder, you know, I, I use the term, you know, that was brought up about the Holy Roller, but, you know, just the fact that maybe it started building a little bit of enthusiasm because, you know, do I <coughs> want to go and be potentially bored or do I want to possibly go and where there's some excitement? You know, do I want to go to the this theater, theatrical thing that, that's happening? And you ask the question and you bring that to the present day. I think that now with TV, news broadcasts, internet, all the stories, now we have this, this new challenge because I think there are so many people, I'm going to use the term broadly, evangelists that we've seen on TV, you know, who have gotten into trouble, were there for only the money. You know, you talk about revivals, and again, maybe it wasn't true, or maybe it was a scam or something like that. Well, back two, three hundred years ago, you know, maybe that wasn't broadcasted quite as much, so the Methodist Church was able to grow. Now, that really fills my mind, you know, because you ask, you know, would that be acceptable in today's age? I think, and I think Scott or somebody said, probably not. Because, because I have a very, I, we, society might have a very negative thought about it's a scam or people are just trying to get some money and fill their pockets and all that. And so I, it seems like you do a very good job. You, you show more energy than what I've ever seen in any of the churches that we've gone to. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of writing that, I think that you're kind of trying to, you're on that fine line of not going too far to the point that you get the impression of, well, or over the, over the top. But you, you bring so much more than what I am used to, and I know it's made a difference in both of our lives. But I, I think that it's a, I'm just repeating, it's a challenge then of how to take that story and promote it, you know, by just through the faith and try to convince people about something that's supernatural. One, yes, come. I'm just uh, um, listening to Steve and I wonder, why do we accept that behavior at a sports event? People get uh, very fanatic about what's going on, but we wouldn't accept it at church. It's the beer. Uh, the beer, beer. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I said it's the beer. <laughs> Next Sunday, we're having beer. <laughs> no, but that's, that's an excellent point. It'll be old Milwaukee. It's cheap, but it's beer. <laughs> but people will go through, they'll set out in blizzards and in the rain and wind and freezing temperatures to go to a football game or uh, but if it gets cloudy they're not coming to church. I mean shouldn't that be shouldn't that be the other way around? <laughs> but where where does the supernatural fit into the ball game? I think that if the super <laughs> if we accepted she knows I'm here. Um more expression of actually what's going on in the church. If we accepted that, like, you know, my impression of the Holy Roller Church is going in there, I'm thinking, 
I don't want to be here, right? But if I was at a football game and that same stuff goes on, there's people standing up chanting their chants, all the supernatural, superstitious stuff that they do, mm. and everybody just accepts it. It's just part of it. But if that happens in church, then we don't. Steve, thank you for your words a while ago about my balancing the uh, over the top thing. Maybe um, you don't. Maybe you don't want it. Maybe that's just that's just my. No, no. Thank you. No, it's it's a it's a, it's a very apt description um, and very kind as well. Um, it's. Uh, You, what we try to do here, what I, what I try to do when we build worship is to create a space for the created and the creator to come face to face, right? That's what we're looking for is that divine interaction, right? You're not going to remember my sermon. I don't remember my sermon, right? Uh, you you know you may remember a story out of it or something like that, but but it's it's odds are you know five weeks from now somebody says what did Gene preach back on August sixth you're going to be like I don't know <laughs> and you know and and I don't know right I mean you don't remember that but what you will remember is an encounter from God. So if I incorporate that into the worship. If we can actually do that, right? If we can create a space for the creator and the created to come head to head, I can't intellectualize you into the kingdom of God. I'm never going to convince you to follow Jesus, right? I, I, I can't do that. That's a divine thing. That's a God thing. That's a I stand at the door and knock thing. I can create a space. I can lay something out in front of you and try to create that space where God is present in this room and you come face to face with God and you walk away a changed human being because you cannot be in the presence of God. You cannot stand face to face with the living God and walk away the same human being you were prior to that interaction. So how do we, how do we help that faith along? We create a space where you can have that experience, right? Where, where you can be healed or where you can experience an overwhelming impression that God puts on your life or, or you can experience a dream that you never dreamed that you would dream. I, I've got to honestly tell you, I'm, this dream thing is new to me. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a last few years kind of thing in my life and Wow, you know, God is, done, God is doing amazing stuff in my life with, with, with you know, vivid supernatural dreams that, that he's giving me. And, and I, I, I thank him for that yeah. because it, it's new. It's a brand new thing for me. Watch out for the new, Right? He, scripture says, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And that wasn't just the coming of Jesus. He's doing a new thing in us. All of a sudden, we wake up to things that we never dreamed were possible. And I'm, if, if you're waiting for somebody to convince you of that, you'll be waiting a long time. The only thing that's ever going to change your mind on that is to experience it. You know, and, and all of a sudden, to be filled up with the presence of whatever it is, and once you are, and it may even take you a while after you've experienced it to incorporate it into your life and say, yeah, that was real. Anybody in here ever had the supernatural come into your life, something wonderful happened, and, and you're like, ah, that didn't really happen. First thing we start doing when the supernatural comes into our life is we start trying to relegate it to circumstance. Right? We just want to relegate it away, you know. Well, yeah, it's coincidence. It's, it just happened. Hmm. 
So I'm going to make a statement about me. And this isn't about anybody else, but this is about me. I've seen too much not to believe what God can do. And there's nothing out of the realm of, of possibility in the kingdom of God. It's just, you know, there are nothing. Nothing outside of possibility. And um, in my prayer, and I'm going to be very careful in saying what I'm about to say next, because I've seen how it works sometimes, but my prayer for, for everyone sitting in this room right now is that God give you an experience of the supernatural in your life. And I'm going to be careful because last time I did, Scott's like, don't include me in that because I, you, you may not know this story. Some of you may, some of you may not. But when I first, when I first got here, after a Bible study we had back in the back one night, some of the, I don't know, Brian, if you were here that night or not. Yeah. But we were all sitting in here talking. And Scott, uh, do you mind me telling this story, by the way? It's a little too late. Uh, uh, and Scott had, Scott had made a statement that he had a difficult time believing in, in miracles. You know, is that correct, Scott? That's kind of the way it went. And, and he had a difficult time believing in miracles. And so I told him, I said, well, I'm going to pray for you. And I told him about my trip from, from Israel. Right, you know, that, that, the plane thing that I've talked about ad nauseum. And so I, I was talking about that and I, I said, you know, I don't want God to give you a heart attack for you to recognize his presence in your life or, or for you to get your miracle. But I am going to pray that God give you a miracle. And it was only a week or two later that Scott had this massive heart attack and died on the table at Mary in general. And, and, and after dying on the table, the doctor had worked on him and left him because, correct, Scott? Yeah, they, were, they shocked me twice and then they were backed off. Uh, and then the, the nurse was at my head screaming for me to get up. But when I come to, that's what I remember. But yeah. So... So Scott comes back too, and well, here he is. <laughs> and so I'm going to be very careful in saying I'm going to pray that you all have a miracle, you know, in your life because you know there's only so many spaces in the Mary in general emergency room, you know. So, uh, but I'm not wanting any of that to happen. But I do want I, the supernatural. You know, to, to break into your life in a very significant way. And I'm praying that... I have heart attacks at one time either. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think part of revival is in us. Right? Revival isn't just this thing that springs up, you know, in a community or in an area. Revival happens in us. And I, I think that that one of the ways we have revival in this church is for us as individuals to experience the power of God in our, way, our lives in a profound way that changes our relationship with him. That's what the miracles are for, right? There, there's never a time that there is a miracle that God does that it is not to enhance his word in your life. The purpose of the miracle is to enhance the word of God in your life and to make it profound and real for you. So I'm praying that God makes his word real in, in, in your life in a profound way and, and change the way you look at your relationship with him uh, because there's so much more. Plumbing the depths of that particular rabbit hole would take an eternity, <laughs> right? You know, it, it's... It just would. And, and that's what was happening in the early church, for better or for worse. And yes, absolutely, there were people who were faking it, but there were also people that were not. I mean, there were people who were called into ministry and whose lives changed. You know, who, one, one guy was talking about that he had, he 
was a preacher and he said he prayed over this guy and he said he'd seen people fall out before and this guy fell out and he said he always he just told everybody he said he'll be fine just leave him for a while he said two and a half hours later the guy's still laying there and his hands are cold and his fingers are drawn and he said you know the guy's got you know his, his face is everything's cold and he's like lord i've killed him and you know and he's like what do i do here and he said in about 30 minutes the guy starts to move and gets back up and he Gave his, you know, changed his life. And, but he said, I, I told God, he said, I've killed him. <laughs> you know, I, so, so, uh, so I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But just because you can't explain it doesn't mean it's not real. Because I'll tell you something, folks, we can't explain Holy Communion, but it's real. We, we can't explain salvation, but it's real. Think, think about that for just a second. In the terms of the supernatural, that in a decision that you make, looking in the face of God and repenting and giving your heart to Him, all of a sudden, He takes and writes your name in the Lamb's blood on the book of life. Simply because, Dick, you said yes. I want to follow you. I believe in you. I love you. I repent. And now your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And you have eternal life. And Jesus said that very thing. He said, what's the bigger deal? That I healed this man or that I forgave his sin? And the bigger deal is that he forgave his sin because he connected him with God in an eternal way. Miracles are a little thing. Salvation's a big thing. Yeah. Miracles change my, my physical self right now, right? Miracles, you know, uh, takes a growth off of me or, or a cancer away from me or a miracle fixes my physical body. I, I, nobody gets out alive. Something's going to take us out. So it's a temporary fix at best. But this thing that God does with forgiveness... That's not a temporary fix. My soul is attached to the divine narrative of God. I am now part of the story of God. That ought to, that ought to shake us up. Steve, to know that you can't tell the story of God now without your name being in that narrative. Because God took you and wrote you into his story. That, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Is there any way that you can connect our church with, or draw a line between our church and then what took place, what was it last summer at Ashbury College with the big revival that they had there? Because, you know, as I, as I try to look into the future and see how we can grow our church and spread the gospel, I go back to what took place, that almost like a miracle that took place down there. And I think somehow they were able, you know, somehow they were able to enlighten people to show their faith and come together on a big scale for many days and I hope that we can do that on some scale here. I will simply say this, the spirit blows where the spirit will. Yeah, I mean, yes. and, and you can't control how the spirit operates like that. Uh, I do want to say this about that though. That wasn't the first revival that they've had at Asbury. They had another revival back in 19, I think 71. Uh, 71 or 72. And it did the same thing. It just went on. Started in the chapel and this revival just took off and, and it went, right? And at that very same time, uh, I was not, not the exact same time, but in that season, right? In that season and that year, 
uh, the Holy Spirit wasn't just moving in Asbury. The Holy Spirit was moving all over the place, right? It was moving through the region. Let's just say that. The Spirit was blowing and moving through the region. And I preached a uh, revival, 71. How old would I have been? Uh, 70, 57, 67, 70, 15, 14? No. <laughs> what's what's 57 and 71? Somebody help me out here. Uh, when were you born? 14, 14. And yeah, I would have been 14. And I preached a, a, preached a revival in uh, Mason, West Virginia, in this little tiny church. And the whole church building would have been the size of this uh, center section, the seating section. So just this center section and a pulpit, you know, up front. And it was just a small building, right? They invited me to come up and, and preach this revival because, like I said, I'd preach anywhere. And so uh, it was about two and a half hours from the house. And uh, so I had to get transportation. So they, said, they sent somebody to pick me up after school and then come up there and I'd preach at night and I'd go back home and go to school the next morning. They'd have somebody waiting to pick me up and bring me back up, and, and, and that's the way we did it every day. But it became an issue because after two or three days, revival broke out. And i got to tell you, I had preached these same sermons. I only had a handful of them. You know, and I'd preached my sermons at all kinds of other churches, and you have moderate success with them. You know, you know a lot of times you, know, you get your attaboy, you know, it's good, you did a good job. It's crazy that a 13 year old kid's preaching or something like that. But, but all of a sudden I go there and I'm preaching and revival breaks out and people start rushing the altar to repent. And I got to tell you, it was not my sermons, you know, and, and so they're coming to the altar. So by the fifth night, there are people sitting on the hoods of their cars outside the church and they've got the windows open so that people could hear on the outside. Well, the next night, they took speakers and put outside so that the people outside could hear what was going on inside. Six straight weeks of revival every night, seven days a week. And when we would do the invitation, and I'm in uncharted territory because I don't have time to write sermons. I got to go home and go to school. Go to school, get in a car, and on the way back up there, try to figure out what I'm going to say when I get up there to preach that night, right? So, so that's my sermon prep is whatever time I had riding in the car, you know, with, with, with this dude. Every night when they would do the altar call, people were coming in through the windows to get to the altar. I mean, they were bringing people in, and they were stepping over people to get to the altar so that they could kneel down and pray. You can't create that, right? You, you can't manufacture that. And, and while you can do things to get the word of God out, there are times when the Holy Spirit moves and when the Spirit moves, Asbury breaks out or, or Mason, West Virginia breaks out, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I, wish, I wish, because if we could, man, we'd bottle it. You know, we'd, we'd just bottle it and we'd take it all over the world, right? I'd go straight to Berkeley, you know, and open it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Watch them run out into the ocean. You know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I said that out loud, didn't I? Uh, but, um, but I don't think you can manufacture it. I think it has to be a, the, 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 the spirit blows where the spirit blows. The winds of the spirit, you know, are not controlled. And uh, you, can't, you can't, even though churches try to, you can't ratchet up the Holy Spirit. You know, you can't sing the right songs or, you know, you can't, you know, gyrate your hips enough when you're on stage enough, you know, to, to get the spirit all welled up. You can't, you can't screw it up, you know, ratchet it up. The, the, spirit, the spirit shows up when the spirit's invited, when it's welcome. You know, when he's welcome, the spirit comes. And, you know, 
we have a very regular service here, but I, folks, let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit worships with us. You know, I have no doubt in my mind the Holy Spirit worships with us. And God's sending people. You know, God, God you. Yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah, that, that, that's you. Okay, so next week, you're under the bus. Okay, just... just uh, but, but, you know, the God... Look, look, look in this room right now at people who are here that weren't here, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. So it's, it's a big deal, right? And, and it's uh, God, God's doing stuff, and God's going to keep sending people here because the Holy Spirit's welcome, right? And we proclaim Jesus Christ, him crucified, dead, resurrected, ascended, and coming again. It's, it's a simple message, Right? And as long as we proclaim that, God's going to honor that. And, and, and we will get the miracles. And we will get the supernatural. And we will get all those things. Not because... Not because of any one person in this space. But because of the one that was invited into this space. And that's the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's what will do it. Uh, I know we're a ta- Yes, Kathy. I would have loved to have seen a video of you preaching at 14. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you something. Somebody should have helped me with my clothing choices. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't even matter. <laughs> well, my mama's house burned, so all that burned, and I was so happy. When all those pictures went up in smoke, you know, there were spirits that were screaming, crying out of those pictures. You know, ah! That's really something. Let me just give you some kind of an idea of what that looked like, okay? I had, and I had bought this with the money I had made preaching, okay? I, I got me a suit. And I went to this place over on 29th Street in Huntington, West Virginia, a little suit shop. And they advertised the world's cheapest suits, and boy, were they right. And I got, bought me this double knit suit, okay? Now, my pants were white, okay? I mean, bright, brilliant white, not, not winter white. They were white double knit with gigantic bells on them. I mean, they, they had the full bell, you know, elephant bells. You remember them had a two and a half inch cuff on the bottom of those puppies. Now, underneath it, I had platform shoes. You remember the platform, the platform shoes with that two and a half inch heels on the back of them that made me about six, two and a half, you know, at the time I felt good because I was finally tall. And, and but that, that wasn't the best part. I had a blue sports coat that went over top of that I had a second pair of pants that came with it, hallelujah, and amen, buy one coat, get two pairs of pants free. And that pair of pants was made exactly the same, except for it was red, white, and blue checkered (laughs) pants, okay? And they were the little tiny checkers, not the big ones. You know, they were just little red, white, and blue checkers. And on my coat, on my coat, my pocket, the, the little flaps on my pocket, matched my pants. Oh, red, white, and blue pocket flaps on a blue sports coat and a white shirt with a bow tie. I have no neck. Okay, when I wear a bow tie, it's like up to right here. I mean, I smile and get spit on my earlobes, okay? I have no neck. And, and so, so that was my preaching suit. Right, and it was a it was a sight to behold. And you look like you might have been straight from Motown. Well, <laughs> well maybe that's why the crowd was so big. <laughs> <laughs> they came to see the suits. It it <laughs> I promise you, I promise you. After the first night, it was blue jeans and a t-shirt because I was out of suits after the after the first night. Uh, but um, yeah, that's kind of what that looked like, Kathy. Uh, it, uh, 
It was a moment in time. I'm sure you don't have a picture. <laughs> I'm, if I did, I wouldn't share it. <laughs> but no, I, I, I do not have a picture of that, Dick. I wish I, actually, I wish I did. I was more interested in the sermon part. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, What's your name? I know that wasn't Deb. <laughs> Usually it's Deb. Um, so I'll throw her under the bus and she's not even here. Um, I want to, I know we got to go because we're now about 10 minutes over our time. Uh, I want to read this passage of scripture and I just want this to swell over you, okay? I just want you to just bask in, in this scripture. This is 1 Corinthians 12. I asked a question a few minutes ago. What, what, what's our part in the gifts? Okay. And Paul is writing this to the church, not, not to the preachers. He's writing this to the church. He said, now about the gifts of the spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or another, you were influenced and led astray by, to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the spirit of God says... Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes all of them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. So this is your role. Because He's not talking to the preachers. He's talking to the body. And these are the gifts of the body. And He goes on to talk about all the different parts of the body have a different role. That the toe, the toe, the toe... The toe uh, has a different function than the hand, and the head has a different function from the feet, right? It, it's all of us have our role, and all of these are gifts that he gives us. And the one thing I do want to say about it, even though one particular gift may be the thing that your superpower spiritually, and it's not you, it's the spirit in you doing it, Okay. Just know that. It's, it's not you. But this is the thing I want you to hear. That even though you're given the one thing, when you need it, all of the gifts are available to, to you. Right? There's never a time that if God needs for you to use one of the gifts, and it's time for you to use it, that it's not available to you to use. And that, see, we, we tend to look at our preachers and our leaders and say, well, that's for them. Right? You know, that's for the people who are, no, it's for us. And, and I just want you to hear that because there's way more to this than you think. Shakespeare was onto something when he said, there are more things in heaven and earth, dear Horatio, than can be found in your philosophies. There's a lot out there. What does God have for you? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, I know this was heavy tonight, but I'm glad we had this discussion. Let's pray. Holy God, right now we just want to uh, say thank you for your presence. 
you said where two or more gathered, you would be there and that to bless. And I know you're here. I know you're in this room with us. And I know you're already ministering. I know you're breaking through resistance that you're building up and you're encouraging, that you're filling up, that you're holding up and wrap your arms around each and every person that's here. I wanna say thank you for every person that's here. That the testimony of their presence is to their desire to be in relationship with you. It is a testimony of desire Their very appearance in this space is a yes to you in their lives, in my life. Now, God, we ask that wherever Wayne's at tonight, that you be with him. All the others in our church that are broken and hurt and sick, that you be with them. Come, Holy Spirit, come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.